Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us to learn more about day-to-day -day management of PKD in children. I am Nicole Haar, Director of Community Engagement at the PKD Foundation, and I will be your host throughout the webinar. We will get started with the presentation in just a moment, but first I have a few announcements. Please note that the PKD Foundation does not offer medical advice and the information shared during this webinar is not intended to be a substitute for consultations with your healthcare professionals. Care and treatment decisions related to your health must be made in consultation with your healthcare team. All attendees will remain muted throughout the presentation to ensure good audio quality for all viewers. We are recording this webinar and will archive the recording on our website within the next few days. If you have questions during the presentation, please type your questions into the question box located in your control panel on the right side of your screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session immediately following the presentation. Please note, we will address questions related to the webinar topic. If you have specific medical questions, please follow up with your healthcare team. I am delighted to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Aram Hartung. Dr. Hartung is a pediatric nephrologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Her research interests include autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, ARPKD, development of imaging biomarkers of kidney and liver disease, and neurocognitive outcomes in children with chronic kidney disease. She currently serves as chair of the research committee of the American Society of Pediatric Nephrology and is the associate program director for the Pediatric Nephrology Fellowship at CHOP. Dr. Hartung's research is funded by grants from the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Hartung is on the faculty of the Perlman School of Medicine at Penn as assistant professor of pediatrics. Dr. Hartung serves on the PKD Foundation's PKD and Children Council as a physician advisor and has assisted the PKD Foundation with educational resources, including our ARPKD handbook. Dr. Hartung, I'm going to turn this over to you. I think there's a delay. One second. There we go. All right, thank you so much for your kind introduction, Nicole. Thank you all for joining us this evening. All right, so uh, Nicole um, introduced me uh, very well, so I won't uh, linger on the slide, um, but I will just point out um, that uh, at CHOP, we also run a combined kidney liver uh, clinic that uh, I do in partnership with my colleague in uh, hepatology, Dr. Jessica Wen, where we see uh, patients with ARPKD and other genetic diseases that affect both the kidneys and the liver. So um, my talk today is about day-to-day -day living with PKD, but of course you as families affected by PKD are the real experts on what it's like to live with PKD. Um, but of course, every child's PKD journey is different. So my goal tonight is to help you understand more about the medical and scientific aspects of living with PKD and its associated symptoms. Um, and as Nicole mentioned, um, anything we talk about tonight does not replace the expertise of the medical team that knows your child best. Um, another webinar uh, later in the year will be covering liver disease and PKD, so I will uh, only touch on that very briefly tonight. So my goals for tonight are to review what the kidneys do, how kidney cysts form and grow, differences and similarities between ARPKD and ADPKD, and then uh, talk about living with PKD and its associated symptoms. So to start with the very basics, um, as you are well aware, there uh, we have two kidneys located in the back, just under the ribs and they're connected via two ureters to the bladder, and then the tube that leaves the bladder is called the urethra. The kidneys receive their blood flow from uh, arteries that branch off the aorta, and as blood flows into the kidneys, the kidneys uh, clean and process the blood, and waste products are excreted into the urine, and the clean blood returns to the body uh, through a vein into the inferior vena cava. If you were to zoom into the kidneys, as shown here in the yellow triangle, you would see that there are um, 
thousands of these filtering units called nephrons. And there's about a million of these nephrons in each kidney. And what they consist of is a filter called the glomerulus that is connected to a, a series of tubes called the tubules. And this is where the filtering happens. So blood flows into these filters, um, it's processed, and then the uh, fluid that flows into the tubules is the uh, beginning of what ends up being the urine. And the tubules are responsible for uh, processing that fluid into um, the final form that will be the urine. So what do the kidneys do? Um, what we're probably most familiar with is the kidneys function of getting rid of waste products from the body, but there's multiple other functions as well. Um, by controlling how much urine is made, the kidneys control the body's fluid balance. They regulate the level of various electrolytes, such as sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, and others. They help to regulate blood pressure. They make a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO that tells the body to make red blood cells. And they activate vitamin D, which is important for bone health. And then you often hear the term chronic kidney disease. So what is CKD? CKD means that the kidneys are not fully able to perform all their normal functions. And CKD can be caused by many different diseases, including polycystic kidney disease. Kidney function is measured using glomerular filtration rate, and GFR is a calculation that is based generally on blood levels of creatinine and sometimes another marker called cystatin C. You can think of GFR as a percent kidney function, although um, it is actually measured in uh, this complicated unit, milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared. And this slide shows um, how we conceptualize CKD stages. Um, these are just, um, uh, the purpose of having these stages is just so that we have a universal language to understand uh, where somebody is on the spectrum. These aren't kind of strict categorizations. Um, but in general, uh, CKD stage one um, is people who have normal level of GFR, so kidney function above 90%, but they might have a kidney disease such as polycystic kidney disease that puts them at risk for having a decline in kidney function later in life. And then you see as the GFR levels go down in increments of about 30, uh, the CKD stage goes up. And then CKD stage five is what's considered end stage renal disease or end stage kidney disease. And that's when the GFR falls below 15. And that's when uh, many times we will be thinking of starting dialysis or considering a kidney transplant. So how do kidney cysts form and grow? I'll actually talk about this uh, uh, together with uh, pointing out the similarities and differences between ARPKD and ADPKD, um, just so that you can see how these two compare and contrast. So what is a cyst? A cyst is a fluid-filled structure. You can think of it kind of like a water balloon. And for that water balloon to grow, you have to have the cells lining that wall, the, the walls of the balloon, have to grow and multiply. And then you have to have fluid filling that cyst. And so to show what it looks like in CKD, in the center here, you can see a cross-section of a normal kidney. And then on the left, you can see a kidney that's severely affected by ADPKD. And you can see that there's multiple bubble-like cysts throughout the kidney. Whereas in ARPKD, rather than having these large bubbles, you can see that there's many, many tiny bubbles uh, throughout the kidney. Um, and they often form more in the central part of the kidney or the medulla first. By ultrasound, you can see a normal ultrasound here in the center with your kidney bean shape in the middle. <clears throat> and in someone with ADPKD, you might see these large uh, bubble-like areas. Uh, fluid appears dark on an ultrasound, and so uh, uh, that's what you're seeing here. Um, and each of these is a discrete cyst in someone with ADPKD. Whereas in ARPKD, you don't really see those distinct uh, bubble-like cysts, but what you see instead is what's called echogenic kidneys or bright kidneys. So you can see all of these areas that look a much lighter shade of gray than what we see in a normal kidney. Um, and this happens because the, there's many, many tiny cysts throughout this kidney that are reflecting the sound waves of the ultrasound machine and make that kidney look brighter than normal. So on a microscopic level, as you recall, I showed you a picture of uh, the filtering units of the kidneys um, called the nephron. And so on the left here, you can see a normal nephron with its uh, glomerulus or filter leading to the tubules that are supposed to be these smooth tubes. 
In ADPKD, you have outpouchings from anywhere along that tubule, and it forms a bubble-like structure that initially is connected to the tubule, and as it grows, it can actually pinch off and become a discrete uh, structure. Whereas in ARPKD, um, the cysts are actually not really separate from the tubule. It's actually this um, part of the tubule itself that gets dilated and, and forms the cyst. And this is the part of the tubule called the collecting duct. And so why does this happen? So in both ADPKD represented here on the left and an ARPKD, the lining of those tubules are made of, a, of cells. And what happens is that the genetic mutation causes those tubule cells to grow and multiply abnormally. So that's thought to be the initiating event in forming a cyst. But then for that cyst to continue to grow, you have to have excess fluid being secreted into that cyst to make that bubble grow. Um, and so these processes are, are regulated by a number of different pathways in the body, such as vasopressin, cyclic AMP, EGF, and CERC. And all of these pathways are areas of uh, very vigorous research to try to figure out which of these pathways could be potential targets for medications to help PKD. And indeed, some of these pathways are already being targeted by drugs that are um, in study or in use now. And so overall, even though ADPKD and ARPKD are different diseases caused by different genes, they, um, the same types of mechanisms cause cysts in both diseases. And so it's important to remember that research in both diseases goes hand in hand, and things that we learn from one disease help us um, in our understanding of the other. So this slide goes over a little bit more detail about ADPKD and ARPKD. So I'll start with talking about ADPKD. So the genes that cause ADPKD, the two most common are PKD1 and PKD2. PKD1 is responsible for about 85% um, of cases, and PKD2 is responsible for about 15%. Um, ADPKD is the most common genetic kidney disease, and it affects about 1 in 1,000 people. As I showed you, the cysts in ADPKD are these large bubble-like cysts, which on ultrasound are visible as those uh, dark circles that I showed you. Um, the age at which most people develop end-stage kidney disease is somewhere um, generally in late adulthood, um, on average um, between the 50s and 70s, depending on the mutation type, and I'll show you some more information about that later. And then some of the examples of associated problems can be liver cysts or brain aneurysms, which I'll discuss later. Um, ARPKD, on the other hand, is the vast majority, really all cases are caused by mutations in this PKHD1 gene, which is a different gene. Um, it's much rarer, affecting about 1 in 20,000 people. And as I showed you earlier, the cysts are these small uh, cysts arising from that uh, uh, collecting duct part of the tubule. And on ultrasound, you have large, bright kidneys, echogenic kidneys, without very many uh, visible cysts. Um, and uh, the age at which people develop end-stage kidney disease can be in childhood or young adulthood. The liver manifestations of ARPKD include congenital hepatic fibrosis uh, and portal hypertension, um, which as I mentioned will be discussed um, at a later webinar. And so as I talk about day-to-day -day living with PKD, the topics that I'll cover are things uh, pertinent to infancy and childhood, kidney function and electrolytes, blood pressure, cardiovascular issues, anemia, bone health, growth and development, infections, and pain. And I'll start with talking about ARPKD um, and then uh, ADPKD, although there is some overlap in uh, some of the issues that people experience in both diseases. So living with ARPKD. So starting um, off with discussing just the range um, of uh, what we see in patients with ARPKD. So many of you may have experienced um, doing a Google search about ARPKD and, um, and learning of uh, what's often considered to be the classic newborn presentation of uh, babies that are very severely affected um, from uh, right at birth or even prenatally, where from during the pregnancy, uh, there's low amniotic fluid, which is also known as oligohydramnios, very enlarged kidneys. Uh, sometimes there's underdeveloped lungs, which is called pulmonary hypoplasia. Um, and unfortunately, even with modical, modern medical care, babies that are very severely affected, um, uh, still about 30% of babies can die. 
Um, thankfully, this, as we've learned more, even though this was considered to be the classic presentation of ARPKD, um, it, it turns out that it's really only about a third of patients who present this way. And especially now that genetic testing is available, we've realized that patients presenting later in life with a disease that can look very uh, different and much milder, that this is all part of the spectrum of the same disease. So the other two thirds of patients tend to present uh, later in, um, uh, can be as older infants or uh, young children or even adolescents. And generally, people who present later tend to have a milder disease pr progression. And a subset of people can also have liver predominant disease. So if a child um, does have that very um, severe early um, presentation of ARPKD, some of the issues that can come up in infancy um, are breathing or respiratory problems. Um, and this is the main cause of illness and death um, in the very young um, infants. And the underdeveloped lungs uh, can be one of the main problems, and that occurs because of uh, the low amniotic fluid. The infant breathing amniotic fluid um, yeah, while they're still in utero is one of the main uh, stimuluses for the lungs developing. Um, so in addition to having underdeveloped lungs, the fact that the kidneys are very enlarged can make it difficult for the lungs to expand properly. About 40% of babies uh, with this type of severe presentation can require uh, support from a ventilator, and it's common to have something called a pneumothorax or collapsed lung. Um, if the baby has very large kidneys, um, it's quite common to have feeding difficulties, and so these babies will often require either a nasogastric tube or a gastric tube uh, to allow feeding directly into the stomach. Um, sometimes in infancy, if the kidneys are very large, we may consider surgery to remove one or both kidneys. Um, and the rationale being that if we really think that the very large kidneys are making it difficult for the baby to breathe or to feed, um, that by removing one or both kidneys that we would make uh, more room in the belly. <clears throat> it is difficult to know what the right thing is to do, however, because of course, um, removing one or both kidneys will uh, make it that the baby will need a dialysis earlier, which is um, in, in and of itself has uh, significant risks. Um, and that added to the significant surgical risks, um, those considerations need to be balanced with any possible benefits to the um, baby's breathing and feeding. And so to talk about kidney function. So um, as we discussed, many children with um, ARPKD will have declining kidney function over time, but the age at which end-stage kidney de disease develops depends on the age when symptoms develop. Um, I'll show you data from uh, the large NIH cohort study that was done uh, several years ago that included 73 uh, patients with ARPKD, um, and what I'm showing on the right here is a survival, kidney survival curve. So this essentially shows um, that um, at age zero, everyone had intact kidney function, meaning not needing dialysis or a kidney transplant. And as the uh, curve stepped down, that means that somebody, uh, that was the age at which somebody um, experienced kidney failure and needed dialysis or a transplant. So the blue curve here shows people who presented in the perinatal period. So that means um, people who had symptoms at less than 30 days old. And you can see that the age at which um, there was only 75% of people remaining um, who still had some level of kidney function was around 11 years. So, so that means about 25% of uh, people were experiencing kidney failure before the age of 11. But you can see that there's still a, a quite a substantial proportion who still had some degree of kidney function even into their uh, later childhood years. In contrast, people who presented later in life, um, the they develop kidney failure at much later ages. So the corresponding number, that 70, the, the age at which 75% of people um, had still some level of kidney function was at age 32. So overall, um, there is really a, a very large range of uh, the age at which people develop kidney failure. In terms of electrolytes and water balance, um, some other common issues can be acidosis. So uh, that means having low serum bicarbonate or carbon dioxide levels, and that's because uh, the kidneys are less able to get rid of acid in the urine. So it's common to need uh, bicarbonate or citrate supplements, such as bicitra. Um, 
For reasons that are not entirely clear, um, a fair number of infants will develop low sodium levels early in life. Um, and this is probably due to in an, an inability to get rid of excess water um, rather than uh, losing salt. And so in general, we prefer to manage low sodium levels by providing less water by concentrating feeds or by trying to give a diuretic called furosemide to promote water excretion. And that's often preferred over giving sodium supplements, which can sometimes raise the blood pressure. Thankfully, the low sodium level um, uh, problem tends to be relatively transient and it doesn't tend to persist later in life. Um, later in life, one thing that is quite common is to have um, an inability to fully concentrate the urine. So that means that many people with ARPKD will make larger amounts of urine than normal. Um, and so it's quite common for children to have issues such as bedwetting. Um, and then they can be a little bit more prone to being dehydrated because um, if they are dehydrated, their kidneys are less able to hold on to water. Um, so what happens when, if the kidneys, uh, if you do have end-stage kidney disease? So options include dialysis and kidney transplant. So uh, dialysis replaces some functions of the kidneys after they fail, namely removing waste products and extra water and balancing electrolytes. There are two main types of dialysis. The first is peritoneal dialysis, which is done using a catheter that's placed surgically in the abdomen. Um, and the way this works is that the, uh, the child is connected to a cycler, as uh, photograph is shown uh, above. And what this machine does is it puts fluid in and out uh, of this catheter into the space in the belly, and that the fluid absorbs um, waste products and extra fluid from the body. And that fluid is uh, uh, clean fluid, um, is cycled in, and the dirty fluid is cycled out multiple times overnight. Um, and that allows the, um, the removal of waste products and the balancing of electrolytes. Um, because this is something that involves being uh, something going into the belly, um, in some children with very large kidneys, the native kidneys may need to be removed to uh, make room to be able to do the peritoneal dialysis. Um, the other type of dialysis is hemodialysis or blood dialysis, and this involves having a catheter or a fistula, which is a surgically created vein, uh, being put um, into a large vein, often in the, um, the arm, or a catheter may also go in the neck. Um, and um, this works by taking the blood from the body, running it through a dialysis machine, which cleans uh, the blood and removes excess water, and then returns the clean blood back to the body. This generally needs to be done in a hospital or clinic three to four times per week for about four hours at a time, um, although there are a small number of uh, pediatric programs that also offer home hemodialysis. Kidney transplant is um, uh, where a kidney from a living or deceased donor is surgically placed into the recipient. Um, there is extensive testing of the donor and recipient to make sure that the uh, blood and tissue types are compatible, that if there's a living donor, that risks to that donor are minimized uh, by making sure the donor is healthy. Um, and then uh, for the recipient, that the risks of complications such as infection are minimized. Um, in children with PKD, it's quite common to need to have the kidneys removed to make room for the transplant kidney to fit in the belly. So in contrast to this uh, schematic shown here where it's showing kind of small shrunken disease kidneys, children with ARPKD can have uh, native kidneys that take up too much room in the belly and make it hard to fit the transplanted kidney in. Um, of course, uh, lifelong medications are needed to prevent rejection, um, but with good medical care, transplanted kidney can last for 10 to 20 years or more. Um, but even with the best lifespan of a transplant kidney, most children um, who receive a kidney transplant will eventually need another transplant later in life or may need dialysis while waiting for another transplant. Um, so to move on to blood pressure, so hypertension is quite a common um, issue in patients with ARPKD. In children, we define blood pressure as being greater than 95th percentile based on age, gender, and height. So just like we measure height and weight as percentiles, there's no fixed number for what is high in children. Um, and so there are some very complicated tables. I'll just show you an um, example of um, the, the section of the table that is for uh, one-year-olds, but this table goes all the way up to age 18. And the 95th percentile blood pressure depends on uh, the patient's height um, and whether they're male or female. Um, but uh, most um, electronic medical record systems are able to uh, calculate this, or your nephrologist can tell you what this would be for your child. 
Um, hypertension is generally uh, uh, completely asymptomatic, but if the blood pressure is very high, you can have irritability or headache. Um, it's important to know that hypertension can develop even when kidney function is normal. So this can often be one of the first symptoms that uh, people with ARPKD can have. Um, about 85, more than 85% of children with ARPKD will need blood pressure medications. Um, and it can be difficult to control. So when we've looked at this um, uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Catherine Dell in Cleveland, we looked at um, a database called the CKID cohort study. Um, and saw that among that group of children, about a third of them needed three or more blood pressure medicines to keep their blood pressure under control. Um, the types of medications used, we often use the class of medicines called ACE inhibitors or a related class called angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, and these are medications that directly target the hormones that are made in the kidney that uh, cause high blood pressure. And these are often preferred um, because they work very well and they're thought to be somewhat protective to the kidneys. Um, one downside is they can raise the potassium level. So if the child has had issues with high potassium levels, we sometimes are not able to use these medications. Um, but there are multiple other uh, medications that also work very well to lower the blood pressure. And I've listed a few uh, names of uh, types of medications here, but there's many others as well. Um, some other cardiovascular issues to consider. Um, so heart health is, of course, um, one of the main uh, things that we think about, and, and good blood pressure control is extremely important for heart health. Um, we often will do echocardiograms to look for something called left ventricular hypertrophy, which is a thickening of the heart muscle that can occur if people's blood pressure is not well controlled. Um, and then um, another thing to mention is uh, you, if you uh, are familiar with ADPKD, you may know of uh, the risk of um, brain aneurysms in people with the dominant form of PKD. Um, in ARPKD, um, we don't generally think of it as being associated with a high risk of brain aneurysms or other vascular problems. However, there have been some rare cases reported. Um, in the literature to date, there have been five patients uh, reported to have brain aneurysms and two with aneurysms in other part of the parts of the body. Um, but really more research is needed to determine whether this is something um, that is uh, a significant uh, risk and whether uh, further testing would need to be done. Um, so anemia is another uh, uh, common uh, complication that can happen in people with chronic kidney disease. So anemia refers to the state of having low hemoglobin or low levels of red blood cells. Um, it can happen in children with any form of chronic kidney disease um, and results from uh, having low iron levels or just inadequate um, iron because people with kidney disease often can't use iron as efficiently as um, healthy people. And so you may need iron supplementation. And as I mentioned before, the kidneys make the hormone erythropoietin, which tells your bone marrow to make blood. And if you have uh, abnormal kidney function, then you may not make enough of this hormone and may need injections um, of uh, either epigen or darbopoietin, um, which um, provide that uh, replacement of the hormone. Children who have ARPKD related liver disease, um, meaning congenital hepatic fibrosis and portal hypertension, can also develop anemia if they have an enlarged spleen, and that um, enlarged spleen can trap some red blood cells um, through a phenomenon called hypersplenism. Uh, more commonly, people will have low platelet counts or low white blood cell counts, but uh, sometimes having a large spleen can also eat up some uh, red blood cells as well. Um, or the other factor is if uh, uh, you have esophageal varices, which are dilated blood vessels in the last part of the esophagus where it meets the stomach. Um, if those bleed, then you can have anemia from that as well. And then bone health, um, as I mentioned before, the kidneys activate vitamin D, which is very important for bone health. And for bones to develop appropriately, they need appropriate levels of calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, and another hormone called um, intact para parathyroid hormone, which is produced by the para parathyroid glands in the neck um, that are nestled right on top of the thyroid gland. So some common problems in children with chronic kidney disease can be high phosphorus levels, which sometimes need to be controlled using phosphorus binders, which are often either a form of calcium or something called cevelomer, which, is, which are taken with meals to prevent you from absorbing the phosphorus that's in the food. 
Um, people can have low calcium levels, in which case they may, may need calcium supplementation. Um, they can have low vitamin D levels and may need vitamin D supplementation that can either be uh, cholecalciferol, which is the regular form of vitamin D that's found over the counter, or something called calcitriol, which is an activated form of vitamin D that is prescription only, or they can have high PTH levels. Um, and uh, that is also treated with uh, activated vitamin D or calcitriol. Um, moving on to growth and development, we know that growth problems are a well-known complication in children with chronic kidney disease from any cause. Um, in the North American ARPKD study that was done by Dr. Gay Woodford a number of years ago, about 30% of children had growth problems. Um, and that seemed like quite a high proportion. And some, some of those early studies seem to suggest that uh, maybe children with ARPKD have more growth problems than children uh, with other forms of CKD. However, when we looked at that, um, at this in that CKID cohort study that I mentioned earlier, we were able to compare um, growth in children with ARPKD to children who had kidney disease from other causes. And we found that, the, um, that yes, there was growth impairment, but that the amount of growth impairment was similar to children with other diseases. So there does not seem to be any ARPKD specific um, reason for uh, growth impairment. It just is uh, related to the chronic kidney disease itself. Similarly, learning difficulties are quite uh, uh, common in children with chronic kidney disease from any cause. Um, and when we looked at this in that same database, the CKID um, cohort study, we found that children with ARPKD had similar levels of uh, neurocognitive functioning to children with other causes of CKD. Um, and in general, scores were slightly below average compared to healthy children. But again, um, the, this seemed to be an effect just of kidney disease in general and not specifically for ARPKD. Um, infections are another issue to think about in ARPKD. So children with ARPKD are at higher risk of having urinary tract infections, and these can occur in um, between 20 and 50% of patients. This may be due to the urine just not flowing well through those dilated cystic tubules. Um, there's also a risk of bile duct infection, something called ascending cholangitis, and that will be discussed um, at, in, in another webinar focusing more on liver disease. Um, and then um, other infections to just be mindful of is that uh, children with chronic kidney disease from ARPKD or any other cause are at higher risk of infections because um, having chronic kidney disease affects your immune system's ability to fight off infections. So we recommend um, that every child, of course, complete their uh, childhood vaccination schedule, um, receive an influenza shot every year, and then in children with reduced kidney function or liver disease, we also recommend an additional vaccination called uh, the Pneumovax, um, which is, uh, protects against the pneumococcus bacteria um, and uh, provides some extra protection. So moving on to ADPKD. So, um, so ADPKD, as I mentioned before, um, it is generally um, something that people think of as being an adult disease, but increasingly we're um, seeing more and more children being diagnosed with it. Um, often it's found um, as an incidental finding. So for example, a child has uh, some sort of imaging scan done for another reason. Uh, perhaps they're having an MRI done of their spine for scoliosis, or perhaps they went to an emergency room and someone suspected appendicitis and did an ultrasound. Um, and that's becoming an increasingly common way that we are uh, making this diagnosis in children. Um, sometimes children will actually develop symptoms from ADPKD, such as high blood pressure, blood in the urine that's either visible or found just on a routine urine test, protein in the urine that might be found in the urine test. Um, they could have symptoms of increased thirst or increased urine output. Um, they may develop a cyst infection um, or rarely develop a kidney stone. Um, and then another way um, that uh, children can be diagnosed with ADPKD is if there's an imaging test done uh, because uh, intentionally because there's a known family history of ADPKD. Or uh, once in a while, it can also be seen on prenatal ultrasound. Um, and especially as the technology advances for how good prenatal ultrasound pictures are, um, there are times where um, 
a baby can be seen to have cysts. And then there's also a subset of children who have a much more uh, severe form of ADPKD um, that can look more like ARPKD, and that's um, often termed very early onset or VEO ADPKD. So how do we make this diagnosis? So um, as you may know, the number of cysts that people get in ADPKD um, increases over time. Um, and so the older you are, the more cysts you need in order to make this diagnosis. Um, in the childhood age group, if you're above the age of 15, um, so between the ages of 15 and 39, you have to have three or more cysts in one or both kidneys um, to make a diagnosis of ADPKD. And this assumes that, um, that this is in a family where we know that ADPKD runs in the family. In younger children, however, because um, random or sporadic cysts um, really don't happen, so um, in contrast to um, adults, um, many healthy adults can have one or two kidney cysts here or there and have it be not a problem at all, whereas that doesn't really happen in children. So in, um, in children less than 15 years old, having even one cyst, um, preferably more than a centimeter in size, or if the kidneys look um, brighter than normal or larger than normal on ultrasound, um, if there is a family history of ADPKD, um, those things are generally sufficient to uh, make a diagnosis of ADPKD. Um, as I mentioned before, um, this, uh, there is an entity called very early onset ADPKD, uh, which is generally defined as being diagnosed either before birth or at less than 18 months of age. Um, the kidneys can look very large and echogenic or bright on ultrasound, either prenatally or after birth, and sometimes this is confused with ARPKD. Um, and then in children without a known family history of ADPKD, it can be a little bit more challenging to make this diagnosis. Um, some things that can help is uh, doing an ultrasound of both parents that um, can sometimes reveal a diagnosis of ADPKD that the parent wasn't aware of previously. Um, but if the parents don't have cysts, sometimes the child will need multiple ultrasounds over the course of many years to determine if the cysts are multiplying or growing in order to make a diagnosis of ADPKD. Um, and in these situations, genetic testing can be helpful um, to make the diagnosis. So one question I'm often asked is, uh, should we be looking for ADPKD in children from at-risk families? So um, there are some potential benefits to making the diagnosis. So some people may uh, have a feeling of empowerment um, or have um, the sense that they can uh, be more aggressive about looking for early complications, such as uh, high blood pressure or potentially uh, paying extra attention to diet or lifestyle. But there are also potential downsides to screening a child and making this diagnosis. So of course, there's a potential anxiety or stress that comes with um, having a diagnosis, um, the potential to medicalize a child who's otherwise healthy and feeling fine. Um, there are potential insurance risks, um, less so for health insurance, um, as long as pre-existing conditions are still covered, um, but also for life insurance and disability insurance. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is um, even if a child who, who comes from an ADPKD um, affected family, um, if that child has a normal ultrasound, um, it does not necessarily mean that the child doesn't have ADPKD because the cysts can often develop later in life. So you may end up with uh, being falsely reassured if a child has a normal ultrasound. So there's been a number of um, conferences and papers written about this. Um, I'm highlighting uh, a conference that took place in 2015, but there's other literature on this as well. Um, this particular conference, uh, suggested that pre-symptomatic screening of at-risk children is not recommended um, due to the risk of um, psychological consequences, insurance um, concerns, um, and the fact that even if you were to make a diagnosis, it wouldn't necessarily change the overall outcome. Um, but overall, this is still an area of ongoing discussion, and it's very much a personal decision. So when my patients ask me what to do, um, I generally um, I discuss it with each family individually. Um, as a rule, I don't um, generally recommend screening everybody um, for um, by either ultrasound or genetics if the child is not having symptoms. But some families will choose to get uh, their children screened, and that's perfectly okay as well. 
but it is very important to make sure that uh, the family understands all the potential um, implications. Um, and so if this is uh, and something that any of you are thinking of for other children, then this is something um, that would be important to discuss with your doctor um, and potentially even considering a genetic uh, counseling referral. Um, so if a child is at risk for ADPKD, um, my recommendations are to make sure that the child um, is getting their blood pressure checked yearly, as all children should be during their regular well uh, child physicals. Um, you can consider doing a urine test, which isn't necessarily part of a routine physical, but you could consider asking for it. And if any of those things are abnormal, then I would recommend referral to a pediatric nephrologist. Um, healthy diet and exercise, of course. Uh, drinking plenty of water, but uh, no need to overhydrate. But then when that child does turn 18, um, I often do recommend, um, I usually do encourage the child to pursue uh, screening to make the diagnosis. But again, even at age 18, some people may not um, yet have cysts. Um, so it's important for them to be aware of their risks so that they can uh, seek care as they get older. Um, if a young person, so anyone say under the age of 25 or so is being considered as a kidney donor for a family member with ADPKD, um, most donor programs would recommend genetic testing to make sure that that person is, does not themselves have ADPKD um, because uh, a young person could have um, not very many cysts or no cysts on ultrasound, but still actually have um, the disease. Um, and then um, another question that comes up is, should parents of children with ADPKD be screened? Um, and so what I've found in uh, uh, many of my patients is that um, uh, there are some times where a parent might know that ADPKD runs in previous generations of their family, and then the diagnosis is made in their child, but they themselves don't know their own PKD status. Um, so in those cases, I always recommend that the parent um, undergo an ultrasound and, and seek care from a nephrologist. Um, and then sometimes the, the parent may um, even know that they themselves have ADPKD um, and maybe even seeing a nephrologist. But um, for, for any adult with PKD, if you have the opportunity, I do recommend at least once to try to have a consultation with um, a nephrologist who has some expertise in PKD care, um, just because there's some specifics of PKD care that are a little bit different than what a general community nephrologist may be familiar with, um, such as the need to screen for aneurysms, um, some of the newer medication options, and options for research. Um, and then, as I mentioned previously, in children um, in whom the diagnosis of ADPKD is unclear, I will often recommend a kidney ultrasound of both parents um, to help to um, establish the diagnosis. Um, so uh, talking about kidney function and ADPKD, as I mentioned previously, most, most people will maintain normal kidney function through adolescence. Um, but we do know, um, as shown in this schematic in the top right, that as the kidneys uh, grow and develop more cysts and those cysts um, uh, multiply and become larger, that the rate at which that happens um, correlates with the uh, declining kidney function. Um, but interestingly, the kidneys are able to compensate quite well. So you can actually have kidneys that have quite a lot of cysts in them and still maintain a relatively normal level of kidney function because the remaining kidney tissue that's between the cysts is able to uh, kind of work harder and hyperfilter um, and keep up. Um, but eventually, um, there is often a decline in kidney function. The age at which kidney failure develops um, depends on the gene mutation. So as I mentioned before, there are two genes, the PKD1 and PKD2. PKD1 is the more common gene. Um, and this is another one of these uh, survival curves as I showed before. So this um, shows the age in years at the bottom. And, um, uh, and then this shows the proportion of patients uh, with um, some level of uh, kidney function. And so you can see as the curve uh, goes down, that's when uh, individuals are starting to experience kidney failure. And so the average age of uh, kidney failure or end-stage kidney disease in people with PKD1 mutations is around 55 years. And for people with PKD2 mutations is around 75 years. Um, children who have very early onset ADPKD may have faster progression to end-stage kidney disease, um, but this is a relatively uh, rare um, and, and small group of children, so it's hard to have um, very good numbers for, uh, for what the averages are. 
Um, blood in the urine is another fairly common symptom of ADPKD, and this can happen either because a cyst ruptures or there's some broken blood vessels in the walls of the cyst. Um, this can sometimes cause some pain in the kidneys um, or flank pain. Um, the risk of having bleeding is higher in patients who have larger kidneys, for example, if the kidneys are, are uh, greater than 15 centimeters in length. Very rarely, the bleeding can be life-threatening. Um, but because of that possibility, we generally um, advise to avoid contact sports in patients with large kidneys or large cysts. Um, uh, some literature recommends no contact sports for anyone who has ADPKD or anyone who's even at risk for ADPKD. Um, I personally think that's a little bit too strict and that these decisions really need to be individualized. Um, and so um, for any given person, um, those risks and benefits really need to be discussed with their doctors. Um, in terms of electrolytes and water issues, so electrolyte issues uh, such as the ones I highlighted for patients with ARPKD are quite rare and, and uh, rarely ever happen in children with ADPKD. Um, but one thing is, that is common is that uh, people with ADPKD do have a problem concentrating their urine and also make larger amounts of urine than normal. Um, so again, bedwetting um, and urinary frequency are quite common in people who have ADPKD. Um, and because of the um, inability to concentrate the urine, they're also at risk for dehydration and need to make sure they're keeping up with water intake. But again, excessive water intake is not necessary. High blood pressure is another quite common problem in children with ADPKD, and this can develop even when kidney function is normal. Um, in a study where they did uh, something called a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor in children with ADPKD, they found that about 35% of children um, had high blood pressure. 35% of children with ADPKD had high blood pressure um, when using this type of 24-hour monitor. And again, the medications we use in ADPKD are similar to what I mentioned earlier. Um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are often preferred, um, or many other medications are acceptable as well. Um, again, in the heart, um, we do uh, recommend echocardiograms periodically to look for left ventricular hypertrophy in anyone who has high blood pressure. Um, and then another ADPKD specific um, issue is something called mitral valve prolapse, where the valve uh, between the left chambers of the heart can be a little bit floppy. Um, and this can occur in about 12% of children. It's generally not something that causes symptoms or problems, but um, it is often good to be aware of it because uh, um, sometimes children who have this condition might need to take antibiotics before going to the dentist or take other precautions. Um, so if we do find this, then we usually um, um, have a ask for a cardiology consultation. Um, and then one other risk um, that is important to know about in people with ADPKD is we know that um, people with ADPKD in general have a higher risk of brain aneurysms or intracranial aneurysms. Um, however, thankfully, this complication is very rare in children, um, but it, uh, it has been described very occasionally, but because it really tends not to happen um, until people are older, we don't necessarily screen for this in children. Um, however, it is important to know about because a ruptured aneurysm is a medical emergency um, and would uh, present a se sudden severe headache or confusion. Um, so of course, if any of those things happen, you would need to seek um, emergency medical care. Um, to look for brain aneurysms, people often recommend doing a screening MRI of the brain or MRA, a magnetic resonance angiogram that looks specifically at the blood vessels. Um, generally starting at a rate around age 18 to 21. Um, but of course, if there's um, any symptoms such as recurrent headaches, um, then uh, you could consider this sooner. Um, people with ADPKD are at risk for urinary tract infections. Um, this again can be due to poor urine flow in the cystic tubules. Sometimes a cyst, an individual cyst can come up can become infected, which would cause fever and flank pain. If that happens, um, often IV antibiotics are needed to make sure that you can reach high enough levels um, of the antibiotic inside the cyst to be able to kill all the bacteria. And then finally, uh, pain is an issue that is specific to ADPKD um, and can be due to large cysts that cause pressure or stretching. Um, they can also be muscle aches and pains if you have very large kidneys that can uh, just change the way that you hold your weight and walk and that can lead to problems like back pain. Um, if there's cyst infection or cyst hemorrhage, that can be painful. Um, and kidney stones, of course, can be painful as well. 
Uh, thankfully, all of these complications are generally rare in children, but of course, if someone does have recurrent flank pain, then um, all of these issues should be um, considered. Um, in adults, if there are, um, um, if it is thought that is a particular uh, large cyst that's causing pain, then there are certain procedures such as uh, cyst aspiration, which is removing fluid from a cyst, or um, injecting chemicals into a cyst to make it kind of shrink down, um, or even surgical approaches that are sometimes uh, done. But again, these are uh, rare to be done in adults and, um, and uh, hardly ever done in children at all. Um, so in terms of take home points, um, as I mentioned before, every child's PKD journey is different. Um, living with PKD involves many challenges, but uh, thankfully, as we're getting better at caring for complications, children with PKD can lead happy and fulfilling lives. And this is one of my adorable patients um, on the right over here. Um, and as I mentioned before, ADPKD and ARPKD, even though they're different diseases, the mechanisms that cause cysts to grow um, are similar. And so um, research done um, in one disease benefits the other. Um, so at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hartung. That was um, great information. I really appreciate it. So we are ready to take some of the questions that we have received so far. Um, as we get started with these, if you have additional questions, go ahead and type them into your chat panel and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, I had a couple of questions early on about blood pressure. I know you addressed some of this, um, but I just thought I would ask if your child is at risk, for PKD, when should you begin checking blood pressure? And is it a good idea for parents to check blood pressures at home? Um, so in general, children with, um, for, for most healthy children, pediatricians don't start checking blood pressure as part of their routine uh, yearly physicals until age three. Um, if it is a, uh, a child who may be at risk for ARPKD, um, often um, uh, you may actually want to, like say someone has had a sibling who has ARPKD, um, then it is actually sometimes uh, advisable to screen the sibling for ARPKD by doing an ultrasound. And if that child's ultrasound does not show any signs of ARPKD, um, then you wouldn't necessarily need to be uh, checking that child's blood pressure any more frequently. Um, in children with uh, who are at risk for ADPKD, um, in general, unless they have one of those very early onset forms of ADPKD, if high blood pressure were to develop, it's generally later and later childhood or um, or in the teenage years. Um, so I think the um, the general recommendation of checking blood pressure. Um, yearly at the pediatrician's office starting at age three would be sufficient. Um, in terms of whether parents should be checking blood pressures at home, um, that would be very much an individual decision. Um, if it's recommended by your doctor, then of course uh, you should do it. Um, if they're, um, for very young children, it's actually quite challenging to check blood pressure at home and then there can even be challenges with getting the right equipment at home. Um, and those are things that usually need to be arranged through a home uh, nursing agency or a home health care company. Um, but in general, um, unless you're specifically advised to by your doctor, there isn't necessarily a reason to check blood pressures at home. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question here about um, special mental health management needs of children that have PKD. Um, do they have special mental health management needs and would this be um, more common upon diagnosis or as the condition becomes more severe? Um, I think mental health needs are something that um, are very, very important considerations in any child with a chronic disease. Um, for PKD specifically, I think aside from um, when children first learn about the diagnosis or become old enough to process the diagnosis, I think there are uh, multiple different issues to consider. One is just their own personal illness um, in terms of uh, thinking about how it's gonna affect the short term, their schooling, the relationship with friends, potential needs for hospitalization, as well as thinking about potential um, future issues such as their ability to grow up and uh, potentially get married, have children, et cetera. Um, so I think that is, um, of course, a big issue. Um, but then I think the additional thing that 
uh, can make PKD even more challenging is that there's often uh, multiple people in the same family who are affected. Um, and so the, the child themselves may be worrying about their sibling or their parent or somebody else. Um, and so I think that makes it all the more challenging. So I always advocate um, good mental health care. I think if you have access to a child psychologist or a child psychiatrist um, through either through your pediatrician or your hospital or pediatric uh, nephrologist, um, that's something that, that I always encourage. Okay, thank you. Um, and we have a question here about um, learning difficulties uh, learning difficulties, would these show up before kidney function starts to decline or um, after kidney function starts to decline? Generally, we think of it as something that uh, occurs after kidney function starts to decline, and we think that's because of the buildup of certain toxins that affect brain function. Um, however, there's also some evidence that high blood pressure can affect brain function. Um, so having good blood pressure control is also uh, something that's uh, thought to be important for um, preserving uh, cognitive health. Okay. Um, let's see, we had a question about mitral valve prolapse uh, showing up in ADPKD. Does this develop over time and should um, children be screened? Um, that is a good question. Um, my understanding is that it develops, um, that it's something that um, that is either there or not, um, although um, I don't know for sure whether if it's not there at one point, whether it could develop later. Um, I do tend to do screening echocardiograms in uh, children who have ADPKD um, if they have high blood pressure. Um, whether or not you should do screening echocardiograms in everyone who has ADPKD, I think, is a, um, is a little bit of a personal decision on the part of the uh, doctor. As I mentioned, mitral valve prolapse generally doesn't tend to cause complications, and so um, uh, it's often not something that needs specific intervention, um, but um, I will often get echocardiograms, in, not necessarily in babies, but you know, older kids who have ADPKD, um, often not just to look for that, but to look for any signs of um, heart muscle thickening if they have high blood pressure. Okay. Um, I've got a question here about being a kidney donor. Are parents of ARPKD uh, children usually okay to donate a kidney? Yes, yes. As long as they don't have any other health issues, being a carrier of ARPKD does not preclude you from being a kidney donor. Okay. Um, and how do you know if you have PKD1 or PKD2 mutation with ADPKD? Um, so the only way to know for sure would be through genetic testing. Um, um, you can sometimes get a bit of a sense of it if if uh, PKD has run through multiple generations in your family, um, just uh, based on the average age that we know people with PKD1 mutations tend to have uh, end-stage kidney disease in their 50s, whereas people with PKD2 mutations tend to have kidney failure more in their 70s. Um, so you might be able to guess at it based on your family history, but the only definitive way to do it would be with genetic testing. Okay. Um... So we have a question about, is, is there a process or technique um, so that parents that have ADPKD could have children that would not have ADPKD? That's a really good question. Um, yes, there, there is um, a technology available called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, that's actually available for uh, people with all types of genetic disorders, so including ARPKD, ADPKD, and others. Um, and this involves, um, you, you do have, the baby does have to be conceived through in vitro fertilization. Um, and so what happens is that the um, eggs are harvested from the mother, uh, they're fertilized in the lab uh, with the father's sperm. The, uh, the fertilized egg is allowed to grow up to a stage where it uh, might have, um, you know, eight cells or so. And then they're able to actually take a single cell out of the embryo without damaging the embryo. Um, and they're able to test whether that embryo is, uh, has the disease or not. Um, and then they can selectively only implant the embryos that do not have the disease. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I know we're getting very close. We're actually right on eight o'clock. I'd like to ask one more question. Um, so this comes from a family that has, um, they have a child with AD, PKD. Can you explain what um, germline transmission is and what is the risk of that for other children in the family? So the term germline transmission just means that you inherited the problem uh, from your parents. Uh, so for any genetic disorder, the, d the disease can either have been inherited from uh, the germline, meaning the eggs or the sperm um, that you came from, um, or sometimes uh, the mutation actually happened just in that individual person. So for example, the egg and the sperm did not carry any mutations, but once they got together and that embryo formed, that something happened that that embryo developed a new mutation. So, um, so there are situations where ADPKD can arise um, in what's called a de novo fashion, so meaning that there's no family history of it, but then somebody has ADPKD because they, they themselves developed a new mutation. Um, and sorry, Nicole, I know you, the, there was the question about germline and then there was a second part to that question. What was the second part again? Well, I think that they were trying to determine what the risk is. They have one child that has ADPKD, parents don't have it. What is the risk for other children in the family? I see. So yes, yeah, so if it's confirmed to be a new mutation, so generally you, you do need genetic testing to know this for sure, but um, if the parents have both tested negative for PKD, um, but the child has an, a known PKD mutation, then most likely that mutation was a new one in that particular child. If that's the case, then, then any future pregnancies would not have any increased risk of ADPKD because the mutation that happened in, this ch in that child was a random event that would not really have much of a chance of being repeated again. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, answered the question. So that is all the time that we have for questions. Um, I want to thank everyone that for submitting questions. We had some really good ones, so I really appreciate that. And I want to thank you, Dr. Hartung, for answering the questions and for all the information that you've provided uh, during your presentation and during the Q&A. The PKD Foundation appreciates the opportunity to provide you with the best possible education. After the webinar, you will receive a very brief survey. We do appreciate your feedback and we will use your responses as we develop additional resources and programs in the future. When you complete the survey, please include additional topics that you would like for us to address in future webinars. If you need to reach out to us directly with questions, um, please re email us at pkdconnect at pkdcure.org and a member of the PKD Connect team will get back to you as quickly as we can. On behalf of everyone at the PKD Foundation, thank you for joining us, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.